Hi, this is Pastor Bob Yannion. For the next two days, we're talking on the subject of members one with each other, the fact that you and I are unified. When Saul was knocked down on the road to Damascus, Jesus said to him, why are you persecuting me? Why am I persecuting you? I killed Stephen. No, he said, you killed me. His name was Stephen. No, his name was Jesus. That's how he was thinking. And suddenly Saul had the revelation to touch a Christian is to touch Jesus, but it's also to touch each other. Let's talk about that from the Word of God as we unite around the Word together. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and something to take notes with and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Hello, welcome again to Student of the Word with Pastor Bob Yandian. It's great to have you here today. I want to turn to turn with me to Romans chapter 12. We're going to take a look at verses 4 and 5. And I want to talk today about unity in the body of Christ. One of the major things that Paul stressed throughout his epistles is he stressed for unity. Strive for the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And he talked about when we get to heaven, we'll finally come into the unity of the faith. But in the meantime, we're not going to come into the unity of the faith. He talked about the unity of the Spirit. The unity of the Spirit is the fact we're all one because of what the Holy Spirit did in birthing us into the body of Christ. But as far as the unity of the faith, we won't come into that till we get to heaven where we agree on every subject. In the meantime, there's lots of things we're going to disagree on. But I want you to think about something for just a moment. Can you imagine going to heaven and Jesus walks out to the front gate to meet you and says, well, Bill, Mary, come on up here. Let me ask you some questions. Did you believe in me as Lord and Savior? Yes, we did. Did you speak with tongues? No. Well, then you can't come into heaven. Yet we separate from each other because of that. And they say, well, did you believe that, you know, if you accept me as Lord and Savior, that you can't lose your salvation? One might say yes, and one might say no, because that's something we all differ on in different degrees of how we look at it. What if one said, yes, I do. I believe I can't lose my salvation. And one says, well, I think we can lose your salvation. He says, well, the one that doesn't believe in that, you, you don't get to come into heaven. You realize there's only one there's only one thing that allows you into the kingdom of heaven. Those names not found written in the Lamb's book of life are cast in the lake of fire. So those names found in the Lamb's book of life are allowed to go into heaven. What is it that gets you into the Lamb's book of life? You're saved. I know that might be a shocking thought. The only thing that causes heaven's gate to swing wide open for you is the fact that you received Jesus. Were you dipped in water, immersed, or were you sprinkled? I was sprinkled. Well, you can't come to heaven. I mean, it's what we say. That's the type of things we did. Did you tithe? Yes, I tithe. No, I didn't tithe. Well, if you didn't tithe, you can't come to heaven. All these different things we attach to it all having to do with our understanding, yet we go to certain churches. Did you believe in the sovereignty of God that God chooses who's gonna get saved and doesn't? Yes, well, then you can't come in here because it was freely open to everybody. I mean, all the things we do, understand this, is that that's what the Corinthians went through. They just they just literally were looking at each other and separating over doctrines and chapter after chapter, Paul kept bringing it back to, no, you're gonna to go to heaven because you receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. So in the meantime, we need to learn to get along with each other. I pastored a charismatic church for uh, 33 years was raised in a Pentecostal church, which was really not a denomination. The one that we went to, we were called Pentecostal Grace. There was Assembly of God, that was a denomination under the under the Spirit-filled name. And there was the, you know, Church of God of, of Prophecy and Church of God of Christ and all these different ones and, and uh, the Four Squares. I mean, these are all Spirit-filled, tongue-talking churches, but yet they formed denominations and yet ours was not. We were just a fellowship of churches. We didn't have a specific headquarters. We didn't have, uh, you know, a denomination that we were attached to. We were just a fellowship of churches that believed in the grace of God. In fact, eternal security, we believed in that. And so we made a big deal out of it. I mean, I'd be my friends. That's the first thing I wanted. Do you believe in this? And we'd have arguments with each other. And man, after a few years, I began to realize my mother, especially Bob, just stop it. You know, we're all one because we've accepted Jesus Christ. Let Jesus handle these things when we get to heaven or pray for them. They'll see what you see or for God forbid, why don't you pray and understand where they're coming from? Because we're always going to have individual beliefs in the body of Christ and we need to be members together. Romans chapter 12, verses four and five. Here's what Paul says. As we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. This verse is simply saying all of us form one body. 
You don't have to believe a certain thing to become part of the body except for the fact that Jesus Christ is your Lord. The moment you accepted Jesus as your Lord, you became a member of the body of Christ. And what this is saying is we're all attached to each other. I mean, you suffer if your arm gets hit, but what is it? I mean, but you often, you know, think about this. What if the arm, part of that arm where you got hit was a Baptist part of the arm? Well, when the Baptists get hit, we often say, well, they deserve it. They're Baptist or they're Methodist or they're Lutherans or whatever. And because of how they differ with us in doctrine, we say, well, you know what? They had it coming. No, for them to hurt, you hurt. When man, somebody hits your arm, your whole body begins to react. Anger comes into you and you don't like it when someone hits you there. Well, we ought to face the same thing when it comes to the body of Christ. And that is we are all one together in one body, but we are also individual members. That's what verse five said. We are individual members, one of another. We are all attached to each other, but we're also attached to the head which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something shocking here. Paul is the only one who teaches of the body of Christ and the individual members and separate responsibilities. Only Paul. And in fact, he mentions it in a number of verses of scripture. All right, Romans chapter 12, verses four and five, where we just read. 1 Corinthians chapter six and verse 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 and verse 18, and verse 20, and verse 22, Ephesians chapter two, and verse 19, and Ephesians chapter four, verse 25, and Ephesians chapter five, and verse 30. Look at all those verses, and to think Paul mentioned it so many times, but no other writer mentioned the fact of the body of Christ. Only Paul taught it. So you know what? What we need to do is go back and see where Paul got it. It would be good to see when Paul first spoke personally to the Lord Jesus Christ, and this is found in Acts chapter 9. When he was struck from his animal and then left blind for days, we're going to find out that one of the first revelations he got was of the body of Christ, the fact we are all individually joined to each other. Acts chapter 7, verse 58 we're going to take a look there. Then we're going to ju jump over to Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. Then we're going to go to Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 4. So get ready with your Bibles. Let's begin in Acts chapter 7 and verse 58. And here, this is after uh, Stephen was stoned to death in the streets of Jerusalem. It says in verse 58, and they, that is the religious leaders, the Pharisees, cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. This is Saul of Tarsus. He's not yet saved. He's vigilant. Man, this guy is on fire for God as far as his religion was concerned. Had no personal relationship with Jehovah, but was a devout Jew. And as far as he was concerned, Christians were the enemies of the Jew. And here was a young man that whenever they killed him, whenever they killed Stephen, fear ran throughout the body of Christ. Fear ran throughout the Christian churches. And he began to capitalize on that. Look at chapter 8, verse 1. Now Saul was consenting to his death. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout all the regions of Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, putting them into prison. Interesting here is the fact that Saul went so crazy over the fact that after Stephen was killed, this great persecution arose on the church, which is Jerusalem, because the people began to fear. And suddenly, because of this persecution, Christians were scattered and went throughout all the areas of Judea, then into Samaria. And then from there, we're going to find out they went into the other parts of the world, of which Paul eventually went to, where Christians had went, uh, run to and scattered throughout the world. In other words, the persecution scattered them everywhere. And I love the way that the book of James opens up. James talks about to the Jews that were scattered throughout the world. And the Greek word there is diaspora. It simply means the scattering of seed, like seed going everywhere from the city of Jerusalem. They went into all the world and they started growing crops. More and more Christians, more and more churches, more and more Christians getting Christians saved. I mean, it goes down the list of those things that, that literally made the world uh, a different place. And after that, we come to chapter 18, 19, and 20 of Acts, of which the great revival at Ephesus 
Texas has caused one of the biggest uproars in the entire area. And the whole continent of Asia was shaken because of that. And six other churches started out that church, we are the set, which are the seven churches of Asia found in the book of Revelation. Look at chapter nine and verse one. The verses before this, Saul has gone from house to house, dragging off men and women. Paul even referred to this later in the book of Galatians and simply says, I didn't just drag off men and women, we killed them. I mean, we drug them off to literally kill them, whether it was within lions or just murdering them. They thought they were doing God a favor. They thought that the Jewish religion was it and these Christians were coming and they couldn't understand them. And finally in chapter nine, this is where Saul now is going and he's gonna go to Damascus. Stop and think about this for just a moment. Saul was gonna go to Damascus. Damascus is in Syria. You know why he's going to Syria into Damascus? It's because he's run out of Christians to persecute back here in Jerusalem and Judea and his fame is going everywhere. And man, the Jewish leaders were so proud of what he was doing. They personally sent him out, give, gave him papers so he could go out there and go to the synagogues of Damascus. And then from there, begin to persecute Christians everywhere. So chapter nine and verse one says this, Saul still breathing threats and murders against the disciples of the Lord went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus. So if he found any who were of the way, this is a name for Christianity, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he traveled, he came near Damascus and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to, his, to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? What was that? Saul must have realized something. Wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. The Jewish leaders were dumbfounded at the rise of Christians and no group had ever done this before. This is why he's out killing Christians. The, the Jewish people couldn't, couldn't understand this. The Jewish leaders, the Pharisees could not understand Christianity. Individuals had risen before with a few followers, but were soon killed and their movements were ended. These Christians were dedicated to the crucified Jesus and were growing in numbers rapidly every single day. Persecution from the Jews and Romans only caused them to grow even more. They were extremely dangerous to the Jews because they taught that man is not saved by keeping the Jewish law. People no longer need to go to the temple for salvation, for forgiveness, or for spiritual growth. These were common people. Many who were formerly non-religious all moved with the same fervor, dedication, and love for each other and for the Lord. They declared their love for each other and fervor came from the Lord Jesus claiming he was the Messiah. Here's the other part. They also had the same anointing and power of the Holy Spirit that Jesus possessed to perform miracles, signs, wonders, and get people healed, which caused Christianity to even spread more, just like it did under the Jesus. I'm sure at that time when Jesus was finally nailed to a cross, put into a, a grave, and finally seemingly disappeared, he went back into heaven. I'm sure the Jewish leaders must have breathed a sigh of relief, but on the day of Pentecost, suddenly 120 Jesuses walked down from the upper room. And by the end of the day, there were 3,120 Jesuses. And after the miracle, the man at the gate beautiful, there were 8,120 Jesuses. The thing kept multiplying so rapidly, they couldn't hardly put it out until Saul came along and started killing Christians one after another. When we get back, you're gonna find out how you can have uh, our, my book on the book of Ephesians teaching what I'm teaching right here. You'll be blessed. I'll see you right after halftime. Ephesus was famous for reckless living and idol worship. Even so, the Ephesian church was deeply spiritual. Unlike other letters correcting error, Paul's letter to the Ephesians revealed to mature believers both the truth of who they are in Christ and the practical application of this revelation to their marriages, families, and everyday lives. Bobby Andian's New Testament commentary on Ephesians ties in Greek word studies and scriptural references, revealing God's empowering grace and the unprecedented authority of every believer as part of the body of Christ on earth. To order the New Testament commentary on Ephesians, visit our website at bobbyandian.com. Theology Simplified is a practical guide to foundational biblical truth. Basic doctrines are not difficult, but easy to understand. 
They often become disguised as complicated or deep-sounding words, but the definitions are simple. Using straightforward vocabulary and down-to-earth examples, Pastor Bob makes complex theological concepts clear and practical. Eight crucial doctrines of the Christian faith are demystified. Redemption, justification, sanctification, reconciliation, predestination, election, propitiation, and glorification. These eight precepts, essential for all believers to understand, come to light as you read and arrive at a deeper understanding of the finished work of Jesus Christ. This understanding will allow you to walk in more maturity and stability in your Christian life. To order Theology Simplified, visit our website at bobyandian.com. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. Saul was dedicated to the Jewish religion of his fathers. And what he didn't understand was these Christians said they worshiped the same God he did. He called his uh, Redeemer Jehovah and the Christians called his name Jesus. He didn't see the combination working together because he didn't think Jesus was of God. And he thought he was some kind of cult leader. And rightfully, it seems, Saul remained faithful to the only form of religion he had ever known and was zealously defending it against this new form of apostasy against his God. He saw it as a threat against God, not just against him. He thought he was actually defending God, working for God. We didn't realize that he was opposing God. This really was the Messiah. He thought he was coming later, as Jews still do today who haven't received the Lord. They think their Messiah is coming one day, and we have to declare to them he's already come, and he's going to return. Moses declared that anyone who spoke against the law was to be cut off from Israel, even killed, and he was zealously defending that. Such people were stoned to death and Saul just watched and consented to the killing of such a man that was Stephen. After Stephen's death, because of intensified Jewish religious opposition, great persecution against Christians broke out in Jerusalem and then began to spread to other cities. All this was led by Saul. And of course, Saul is on his way to Damascus. When we left him there, he had just been knocked down off his animal and was on the ground, even in death. The unity of the Christian believers had never been seen like this before. No other cult that they looked at had ever been unified like these people. These people actually considered it a privilege to be killed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they were the ones who had stated to be absent from the bodies, be present with the Lord, to live as Christ, but to die as gain. This only seemed to intensify the Jewish leaders, and they sent Saul to more cities than ever to kill those who call themselves Christians or those who consider themselves as part of the way. Something had to be done about Saul or there would be no more Christians left. Let me give you Saul's testimony. Galatians chapter one. If you want to turn there with me, verses 13 and 14. Here, Paul said, you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how that I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. He literally said here, the, the more zealous I got, the more Christians I killed. The more Christians I got, I killed. The more I advanced in Judaism. The more I advanced in Judaism, the more popular with the leaders I became. The more popular with the leaders I became, the more they advanced and gave me more power and more authority to kill more Christians. In other words, the more Christians he killed, the further he advanced, the further he advanced, the more Christians he killed, 
And finally, God must have scratched his head and said, I'm going to do something about this guy. Either this guy has to die or this guy has to get saved. And that's why on the road to Damascus, when he was actually leaving Israel and going into foreign countries to kill Christians, God stopped him and literally knocked him to the ground and a blinding light came on him. One of the first of the Christians Saul saw killed was Stephen. And Stephen was the one that prompted and started this whole process in his life. He, and, saw, and literally Stephen was strong in his teaching gift, won many Jewish leaders to the Lord Jesus, and they became converts to Christianity. So he was taken before the religious leaders to be questioned and tried and false witnesses had been set up who lied about Stephen. But as far as Saul was concerned, this was fine. Even if we have to lie to kill these Christians, we're going to do it. Even if we have to break the law, even if we break the law of Moses, it doesn't matter. We have to kill these Christians. So false witnesses had been set up to lie about Stephen. They twisted his words to sound as if he was blaspheming God. Stephen's sermon was one of the three best sermons of the book of Acts, ranking right up there with Peter's on the day of Pentecost and Paul's on Mars Hill, Acts chapter 6 and verse 8 through chapter 7 and verse 60. We find his message there, that of Stephen's preaching the word of God. He told how the prophet spoke of Jesus and the Jews of their day and how they killed him. Now the Messiah, Jesus, they prophesied of had come and the Jewish leaders killed him. The Jewish leaders covered their ears and cried out so loud that they could not hear Stephen's sermon. And then they dragged Stephen out of town and stoned him to death. Saul of Tarsus held the coats of those who stoned Stephen and watched Stephen die in rejoicing as Jesus greeted him. He must have got even angrier as Stephen was dying and said, Jesus is standing at the right hand of the Father. Oh, that had to incense him. He didn't even see Jesus as God, much less sitting next to God and now standing up to greet Stephen. Stephen. I wonder if that verse came back to him out of the book of, of Psalms where God said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. That must have come back to him. And now he thinks they're stealing Old Testament verses. They're stealing, book, stealing from the book of Psalms. And it made him even angrier. And the frenzy of the Jews increased. And now a cry rose up for Christians to be killed in foreign cities. Legal permission was given for Saul to go to other countries and persecute and kill Christians. Paul then headed for Damascus in Syria with the blessings of the Jewish leaders to kill Christians. Let's talk about what happened. As Saul was knocked down on that road to Damascus, a blinding light came on him and left him blind. Saul was struck by this blinding light and fell to the ground. He heard the voice of the Lord Jesus speaking to him. And this is what he said. He said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? The Lord Jesus asked Saul why he was persecuting him, and Saul probably reasoned. You know what? Saul recognized the voice. Saul had never received him as savior. There was a form of there was that that was the form of salvation in the Old Testament. Abraham had faith in the Lord; it was counted to him for righteousness. David also put his trust in the Lord; it was counted to him for righteousness. But with all of that, Saul had never accepted Jehovah as his Lord. He was just a practicing Jew and devoutly practicing Jew, but had never actually been saved. And now he's being questioned by the Lord Jesus Christ. And the moment he heard that voice, he knew who it was. He knew that was Jehovah speaking to him. He knew that was his Lord speaking to him, but the words didn't make sense. Saul, why are you persecuting me? The Lord Jesus asked Saul that question and Saul probably reasoned, but Lord, I oversaw the killing of one young man just a helper in this Christian group. And Jesus must have said to him, no, you killed me. But his name was Stephen. No, his name was Jesus. You have been persecuting me. Saints from the day of Pentecost until today form one great body of believers, the body of Christ. We are all part of Jesus, making up his spiritual body on earth. If someone breaks your arm, they've struck you. Do you understand that? If Jesus is the head and we are the body, to strike the arm is to also strike the head because it's all part of one body. For someone to persecute you for being a Christian, they have persecuted Jesus Christ. And here's the point, he's capable of defending himself. Romans 12 verse 19, vengeance is mine, I will repay. How often do we personally think, well, you know, I'll stand up for Jesus. I'll do the Bible simply saying, and Jesus reiterated it in the Sermon on the Mount when he gave the Beatitudes is when they strike you, don't do anything about it. 
Oh, there's times to defend yourself, but not over Christianity. If they persecute you because you're following me, understand this, turn the other cheek. That's the time you turn the other cheek. And so again, these that's what these Christians have been doing. They would not respond back. They would not come back at them and they didn't answer vengeance with vengeance. Again, what the Lord said in, in Romans 12, 19, which is actually a quote from the Old Testament, vengeance is mine, I will repay. God has willed that the risen Jesus Christ and all believers since that day are one body. We make up one individual man, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ and his body. He is the head and we are the body. Ephesians teaches us that the body of Christ and the book of Colossians teaches of the head. The main reason why I'm offering the book of Ephesians on this is the main purpose of the of Ephesians to teach that we are the body of Christ. Colossians is the book that goes with the book of Ephesians and it teaches that Jesus Christ is the head. At the new birth, we become one with Jesus Christ. He and we are the whole man. We are as inseparable from him as he is from the father. We are one with him as he is one with the Father. John 17, verse 22 and verse 23, and the glory you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one as we are one, I in them, you and me, that they may be made perfect in one. Jesus even prayed it in his prayer before he went and was arrested and crucified. He said, Father, they're going to experience something they've never experienced before. Unity with me and I have unity with you. That means they have unity with you also. We are all intermingled. It comes back to this. We have been mingled together with God the Father and with the Lord Jesus Christ, and we cannot be unmingled. In fact, it comes through blood covenant, the shedding of blood, and his blood has been mingled with our blood. Our blood and Jesus' blood has been mingled also with the blood of God himself. In other words, he doesn't have physical blood. It's just a type and analogy. But when you mingle blood, how do you unmingle it? We are one with God. God is one with Jesus. We are one with God. We are one with Jesus. All three of us are one together. You can't tell where Bob ends and Jesus begins. You can't tell where Jesus ends and God begins. We are all one with each other. So we are with you and me, not just me and Jesus and God, but also me and you. We've been mingled together and to touch you as a toe, you've touched me as a finger. We are all united one with the other. Jesus gave previews of this teaching where we would now take his place. And when he left, we would now fulfill his ministry. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Guess what? John 9 and verse 5 says, as long as I am in this world, I am the light of the world. And now we have become the light of the world. He promised us that. Now that Jesus is gone, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 14 tells us we are the light of the world. Jesus was given God's power of the Holy Spirit to show signs and wonders and miracles. Now that we have been given the same power and given the name of Jesus Christ, we are here to do even greater miracles. John 14, 12, Jesus said, the works that I do, you will do also. Jesus was God's ambassador. Now we are ambassadors. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20. We have been given the same ministry of reconciliation Jesus was given. You know what? I thank God I'm one with Jesus. I thank God I'm one with the Father. And I thank God all three of us are one. But I'm also thankful you and I are one through one simple act, accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We'll continue this tomorrow. You can order resources become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.